Hey guys, I'm Sarah, no Eileen today, but we are going to be talking about cranial nerves and how they relate to upper motor neuron lesions. So stay tuned for some of my tips and tricks. So first we're going to review the different cranial nerves. So first we got the olfactory, two the optic, three the ocular motor, four the trochlear, five the trigeminal, six the abducens, seven the facial, eight the vestibular cochlear, nine the glossopharyngeal, ten the vagus, eleven the spinal accessory, 12, the hypoglossal. So now we're going to go over some mnemonic devices that might help you remember. On, on, on they traveled and found Voldemort guarding very ancient, scary Horcruxes. If Harry Potter isn't your cup of tea, there is an alternative. Here you go. O, O, O to touch and feel very good velvet. Such a heaven. You could also make your own, make it funny, make it dirty, whatever it is that's going to help you remember. I've heard a lot out there. I personally only remember about like seven of the names because uh, that's all you're going to need in the future. But one thing you will need to know is the type of nerve it is. Is it sensory, motor, or both? This is my mnemonic device that I love because it's just a cute saying and it's honestly easier for me to remember than others. Some say money matters, but my brother says big brains matter more. So there's only going to be seven that really matter um, for you in the future. So that's going to be five, the trigeminal, seven, the facial, eight, the vestibular cochlear, sort of, nine, the glossopharyngeal, 10, the vagus, 11, the spinal accessory, and 12, the hypoglossal will be your main ones of concern. So now let's talk about what makes them important. Five, trigeminal, is the one that controls mastication, so that's all you're chewing. It also does face sensation. Let's put blue for sensation, so sensory. Um, you could think of like cold, you could feel that. And then red is going to be for motor, for muscles, controls that. Also, if you refer back to your mnemonic device on types, you'll notice that trigeminal has a B with it because it has both sensory and motor. So the trigeminal nerve 5. It has three branches, uh, the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the manibular. The manibular is going to be the most important one relevant to you, a future SLP, just because that one is the one that controls the mastication muscles. Um, there is one that also controls like the sensory of like the sensation of inside of your mouth, and that's going to be important for chewing, but we could talk about that later. Next is seven, the facial nerve. That one controls expressions of the face and also does some sensory things like mucus, salvation, causes dry eye associated with Bell's palsy. Um, another sensation it has is that it has taste for the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And remember that since it does control facial expressions, that's motor and taste and sensory is going to be sensation. So this is another one that has a B for both. The next one's going to be the number eight, the vestibular cochlear. So that's essentially your sensation of hearing and balance. You probably heard a lot of that in your audiology class. Next is the glossopharyngeal, the ninth cranial nerve. It has the sense portion of the gag reflex, and it has a, it is in charge of movement of the stylopharyngeal muscle. So basically, that's just like pharyngeal elevation. Next is the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. It goes together a lot with the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, and the vagus nerve by itself, it just is in charge of so much. It does a lot, but we're just going to focus on a couple of the facts. First thing you need to know is that it has three branches. The three branches do three different things, but we're not going to get into specifics right now. Um, overall, the vagus nerve is in charge of the uh, motion of the palatal movements, pharyngeal constriction, uh, motor part of the gag reflex. It is in charge of the sensation of the epiglottis. Also key here, it is in charge of phonation and the soft palate. So if you have problems here, you're going to have problems with hypernasality and also everything about those vocal folds. Next is the 11th, which is a spinal accessory nerve. It is in charge of turning the head and shrugging shoulders, so all motor. Last but not least, we have the 12th cranial nerve, which is the hypoglossal, glossal meaning tongue. It's all about tongue movement right there. So now we're going to talk about the innervation of the cranial nerves. And just remember that cranial nerves have several branches. We went briefly over 
the vagus and the trigeminal branches, but there's going to be more. So bilaterally innervated versus unilaterally innervated. Bilaterally innervated means two sides. You can think about it as a B for both, or you can think about it as a bi as in two, you know, two. Then we have the opposite of that, which is unilateral, which means one side. It's only innervated on one side. So you can think about it as uni, as in uno, as in one in Spanish, uni, one, uno. So kind of different concept now. We're going to talk about ipsilateral, which means same side. So that means if it started on the right side, it ends on the right side. Um, that's why I like to think of the line between the eye and the eye starts on the same side, ends on the same side. Then it's opposite is contralateral. Contralateral literally means opposite side. So the way I like to think about it is like contra means contrary, meaning other. So if it starts on the right side, it ends on the left side. It starts on the left side, ends on the right side. Opposites. And remember, this is all in reference from the cortex. So it starts from the cortex. So the nerves that are bilaterally innervating, meaning they go to both sides, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10. The nerves that are unilaterally innervated, meaning only they go to one side, is 7, 11, and 12. Knowing that 7, 11, and 12 are the only unilateral cranial nerves is important because it will help you differentiate between an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion. So remember, 7 is the facial nerve, controls facial expression. 11 is the spinal accessory, it controls head turns and shoulder shrugs. Then you got the 12th cranial nerve, which is the hypoglossal, so this is controlling tongue movement. Remember, it's basically going to be your facial expressions, shoulder and tongue, that you're going to see affected if it's a unilateral UMN lesion, so from the cortex. So here I'm going to draw a little diagram. This is going to be my brain, so the cortex. These are going to represent the start of the cranial nerves, and then, you know, they eventually go and innervate those muscles. So again, with the branches, we see that the seventh cranial nerve, the facial one, its motor branch is actually split between the upper and the lower face. That is key, upper and lower face. So I like using the waterfall method. So let's say the right cortex sends a message down to the fifth cranial nerve. It goes down. We know that five is bilateral, so it goes to both sides. Now let's look at the seventh. We know seventh is partially unilaterally innervated. So that's why the upper and lower portion of it is so important. So the upper portion is bilaterally innervated. The lower portion is unilaterally innervated. And the other key part is that not only is it unilaterally, you, you got to wonder like, well, what side does it go to? I know it goes to one side, but what one side? It goes to the contralateral side, meaning the opposite side. The other thing about the waterfall diagram is that you got to think about it like this. The message is like water sliding down from the cortex, right? The primary motor cortex, it slides down and it hits the top of the seventh cranial nerve, right? The upper face branch, it innervates that. The upper branch is good, it got the message, the water slid down, it made it. Now when we look at the lower face portion of the seventh cranial nerve, you can see that only one side is going to get hit, right? Making it unilaterally innervated. And that one side is going to hit the opposite side, the contralateral side. So it starts from the right and ends up on the left side. So you should also think about it as the right cortex is responsible for the left lower face only. It's only responsible for the contralateral lower face. Since we're talking about the right cortex, the right cortex does not care about the right lower face. That's not its jurisdiction. It doesn't want to send a message there. It doesn't want to send water. So now we look at the ninth and the 10th cranial nerve. They're both bilaterally innervated. So the message is being received on both sides. The water goes from the right side and it lands on the both sides, right? Bilateral. Now, when we look at the 11th cranial nerve, we see that it is unilaterally innervated. Now, when we're talking about upper motor, um, 
neuron pathway, so that's from the cortex to the cranial nerve or the spinal nerve, um, that is contralateral. So from the right cortex to the 11th cranial nerve, you know the water is going to be fed and it's going to travel contralaterally. It's going to go to the opposite side. This means that the ipsilateral side will not get anything. It will send water and it will only go to the contralateral side. There isn't a route to go ipsilaterally, so the right won't get it. The same exact thing happens for the 12th cranial nerve, the tongue, right? It is only innervated on one side, and that happens to be the contralateral side, meaning water, the message, will not go to the ipsilateral side. Since we're talking about the UMN, you can think about unilateral is also contralateral. We're going to go ahead and skip the first four since they have nothing to do with speech or swallowing. We already know now that five is bilaterally innervated, so it goes to both sides. We also know that six is bilaterally innervated, so it goes to both sides. We're going to skip eight because we're just not going to worry about it. It's the uh, hearing nerve, not a speech one. Here we're going to go ahead and skip seven because uh, it's a tricky one like we talked about earlier. We're going to go ahead and do nine. Notice how it is bilaterally innervated. Here notice how the vagus nerve, the tenth nerve, is now bilaterally innervated as well. So we're finally back at the seventh cranial nerve. See, just like on the right side, only the top half is bilaterally innervated and the bottom half, the lower face, is only contralaterally innervated. One side, and that one side happens to be the opposite side. We're again at the 11th cranial nerve, and we know that it is unilaterally, contralaterally innervated. So that means if a message is sent from the left side, and it goes to the 11th cranial nerve, controlling shoulder movement, it only worries about the right side. That's the only one it's going to talk to. Pop quiz, what side and how many sides is the 12th cranial nerve innervated by? If you said the it is unilaterally, contralaterally innervated, you are correct. So from the left cortex, it goes all the way to the right 12th cranial nerve. So that controls the right side of the tongue. That's the only one it's talking to. With this highlighter, I am now going to burn in both of our memories, the exception to the rule. All cranial nerves are innervated from the cortex bilaterally, except for the 7th, 11th, and 12th. So the 7th, 11th, and 12th are the exception to the rule. They only are innervated uh, from one side of the cortex, which is the contralateral side, right? They are innervated by only one side, and that one side is the opposite side, right? That's why we say unilateral and contralateral. Another way you can think about it is that the 7th and 11th, the 7th and 11th and 12th cranial nerves do not have a backup system. All the other cranial nerves have, if, if something goes wrong, the other side can take over. But since these are unilaterally innervated, if their one side goes down, they, they're out. So remember, the ones with no backup is the facial expression, the shoulder shrug, and the tongue movement. Those have no backup. Now I'm going to show you my next favorite diagram, which is basically making a face out of the cranial nerves numbers. It's a great way to remember it. So we're going to have five is, you know, the face sensation and then the mastication of motor muscles. And then you have seven, which is facial expressions, then you got nine, nine kind of like makes like the mouth, tongue, uh, like throat area, because that's the, you know, the pharynx, and then you're going to have 10, which is vagus, which is actually like deep throat, so larynx, and you know, it goes down to the heart, and then you have 11, spinal accessory, so that's all about the shoulders and head turning, and then you have 12, little itty bitty 12 is right there, all about tongue movement. Now let's add in those exceptions to the rule so that we could remember which ones don't have a backup plan. The ones that don't have a backup plan are the ones that are unilaterally innervated, which are also, hint, hint, contralaterally innervated. So that's going to be lower portion of the facial nerve, the seven, 
the complete 11th nerve and the complete 12th nerve. So, if you have a UMN lesion to only one hemisphere, only the 7th, 11th, 12th cranial nerves to the contralateral side will be damaged. For example, if you see that the right hemisphere has a UMN lesion like a stroke, you will witness that the left lower face, the left side of the tongue, and the left shoulder are all affected. They're all going to look stiff because it's a UMN lesion and everything else is going to be fine. So let's see that in a diagram. The right hemisphere has a lesion, so from the primary motor cortex, there's no water going to be sent to the lower portion of the seventh cranial nerve. No messages are going to be received because the damage is from above. And again, the side that doesn't get anything is the opposite side, so the left side won't be receiving the message. Now, the right side is going to be okay. Why? Because the right side is innervated by the opposite side, which is the left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere did not have a stroke. It did not have a lesion. The right side is okay. The left side is not okay because it's not receiving water. You can't receive water if, you know, at the top the faucet is broken. The broken faucet also won't be able to send water down to the 11th and 12th cranial nerves on the opposite side. That's just the way it works. That means that the right side, the right 11th and 12th cranial nerves are okay. Well, that's all I have for you guys. I hope this helped some. I hope it was a good refresher on cranial nerves and the innervation of the upper motor neuron pathways and how to differentiate that from like the LMN lesions. Remember, um, I'm not a professional yet. I just got A's in this class. Let me know any other topics you would like me to review and remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Catch you next time.